three minus two unknowns. So it's 32 unvaccinated, 21 vaccinated. Wait, you th- 21? 32, yeah. 33, 34, 36. I'm so bad with math. No, because there's two that are unknown yeah, out of yeah, Naval so Hospital. It's 21. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, 21. <laughs> um, I mean, guys, when you talk Dr. about... Dr. Juan Flores giggling right now at, at our really arithmetic am. skills. <laughs> that was live, wasn't it? Uh, was that live? <laughs> sorry, oh sorry, Doc. Yeah. Four. You know we're in yeah, trouble if like 21. I'm the math expert in here. <laughs> okay, okay, carry the one. And yeah. Shout out to my late math teacher, Mr. Rollins. I don't know if you guys remember Mr. Rollins. I'm, I'm gonna send you the link to the Khan Academy. The Khan ah, Okay. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Doc. They've got some good math programs, actually. So uh looky here. Uh we have uh, Dr. Juan Flores, who was formerly I'm not you know, you know I gotta mention it, the Catholic school superintendent. Uh he's now over at Career Tech. And so that's what happened, guys, in case you were wondering. Um good morning, Doc. Good morning. How are you? Uh yeah, we're doing a you know dealing we're dealing yeah coping yeah you know the one to me i keep thinking that um you know when i make decisions like here right now the decisions only affect 60 students their families and the five faculty members who join me at the school but i don't know what it would be like to be the governor who has to make a decision that affects you know 160,000 people and that is um i don't know i i, I don't know if she sleeps at night I think it's tough. I think um, there are a lot of things that need to be considered. And actually, I, I've been very impressed. And that's what sort of drove me to want to talk about the school, Chris, because yesterday um, I have students, we're teaching science from a problem-based perspective. And the students are studying the similarities and differences between the Spanish flu and, and COVID. And how can we learn from those similarities and differences? And I was so impressed when a student said, one of the things we need to take into into consideration is travel is so much easier now than it was back then. For people to move from one country to another, or for even from one part of a country to another, um, is so much easier now. And that's part of the reason why a pandemic is more serious today than it was maybe 100 years ago. Although, we are the a student pointed out there are four million people in new zealand 28 people i think have died in new zealand we have 160,000 people on guam and i think 150 people 149 people have passed away so we need to take a look at you know what's going on and what is working what's not working um but it's it's a tough time and and I think that personal responsibility is the only thing that's going to help us. Yeah. And I tell the students all the time, stay away from crowds you don't know. Don't go to the mall if you don't have to. Um, stay at home. As my mother would say, stay at home and clean your house. Um, do whatever needs to be done so that you protect yourself and you don't get infected. I want to quote uh, Dr. Akimoto from way back early on. Gus, Gus, Guam. Gus, Gus, Guam. Clean your area, guys. Clean your area. Yeah, but um, Wando, just, l- l- let me ask. So, what's the status with you with the uh, career tech? So, we had the governor um, call for the temporary suspension of face to face learning for grades K through twelve. How long did that kind of put you guys out of commission, and and how quickly were you able to pivot and get uh, kids back in to you know whatever type of classroom they're in? Yeah, Chris, the only glitch we had was we don't give students. Um, we have purchased laptops, um, and this is done with the school. We were not, we didn't qualify for any federal government uh, grants or anything, but we purchased laptops for all the students. The only glitch we had was we needed to make the parents come in and sign an agreement saying they'll be responsible for the laptops. That took us about a day, and and so we actually started on Wednesday. We started online classes on Wednesday, and um, I was I was moved by a parent who talked about hearing uh, laughing and animated conversations when she walked by her son's um, room while he was on one of our classes. And that's actually the way I feel. We had eight days of online learning. But even though for some students, the highlight of those days was playing volleyball at lunch or hanging out with, with new friends that they made, it created enough of a community that when we went online, we knew who we were working with. Um, 
and we could start continuing those conversations and also continue the expectation for learning. So we missed two days of learning. I think we're going to figure out how to make it up. We might um, only have three days next week. We're still deciding whether or not we're going to have a day long symposium on the 20th anniversary of 9 11, um, which we've already started. By the way, we already showed students videos of 9 11 to get them going um, to start thinking about what we want to talk about. Um, but we're on, we're on with online learning, and we're going to try to make sure we don't lose. Time. So all of our classes are meeting every day, and uh, we've reduced the amount of online time so we don't have students suffer from technology fatigue, but then we give them a little more work to do so that they can make up for that time. So it's going well. Right. Um, we don't like it, though. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I don't well, like coming to a school that's empty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you that, though, Juan, because... Uh, I mean, obviously, when you look at the number of positive cases in the community, and although everyone has been saying there's no evidence of the school spread, it kind of reached a point where the community saturation of COVID was just so much that it couldn't help but spill over. I mean, the community, they work in the schools. We have kids that go to the schools. And so it was really only a matter of time before the number of positives um, with the students and the staff would be just so high that, like, uh, I mean, John Fernandez had said it was just opposing so many operational problems in terms of, like, quarantine and contact tracing. Um, and also he came on uh, Wednesday and he talked about, yeah, the, the risk, right? I mean, it's a real risk, especially when you look at the states and the pediatric hospitalizations are on the rise. So I know you're a longtime educator. I know nobody likes online. But um, do you believe that it's necessary, kind of, in – when you look at like what we're dealing with now in week five of, of, of this surge, because I know that obviously in class learning, it's the best, right? That's the Cadillac, right? But I mean, online, it kind of seems like it's a good call right now. I, I think online learning is the Bentley. It's the Rolls Royce. <laughs> um, but, I, but the concern I have, Chris, is, and you hit it, if we're just in school, even if we were in cohort groups in school, we can monitor what the students are doing. We can monitor their exposure. I can go up to a group of students and say, listen, you know, you're not practicing social distancing. But we don't know what happens outside of school, and we don't know what the members of the families are. Now, there are some students who are very sensitive, though, uh, and been very careful because they have elderly relatives at home. Um, but that's not, that doesn't mean everybody's doing that. So while I don't agree that, uh, I don't like the idea of us being away from school, I agree that we've got to take precautions to ensure that our students, we don't have any students under 12 years old, but especially those students who are under 12 who are not vaccinated, we don't want to expose them at all. So my, my only, and, and the teachers and I talk about it every day, we talk about kids all the time. We're just going to make sure that our classes are animated. We don't, we're not going to, we're not going to lose sight of the fact that we've got to keep the kids engaged um, just for the sake of making sure they can subtract, you know, 55, uh, subtract 32 from 55. That's not the key. The key is to keep the kids so that they're still kids in school, keep them engaged and keep them interested in, in doing what we're doing. Um, and I've heard already some great conversations in our classes, um, even in the ones that I'm teaching. And I, I, I think we could do it. Um, I don't know how long we can keep doing it because eventually we're gonna get really tired of this like we did before. But for now, let's keep pushing and encouraging the students um, to, to be on their online classes, do what they can and participate as much as possible. We have a requirement, by the way, that our students have to have their cameras on I tell them it's so that they don't engage any uh, Russian spies to take their place in class, which of course they know is not true. But um, I want to see them. I want to see their faces. And the biggest advantage, right, to online classes, I can look at students' faces without face masks. Hmm. I actually like that. Juan, did I hear you correctly that you guys didn't get any sort of federal uh, monies? Like no, yeah, nothing. But, uh, the requirements for any federal funding is that a school has to be in operation for at least a year. Um, and so we could not participate in anything, and we can't even, 
I thought of sending our students to the community learning centers. Um, in the flyers for the community centers, it didn't show any restrictions, but DOE has informed us that our students are not eligible because we don't qualify for federal funds. So I'm working with the Lieutenant Governor's office and also maybe working with GCC to find other avenues for our students. We have some students who don't have internet access. And I know because when I have classes with them, they're on their phone. So they can't access data, they can't look at videos, they can only participate in the online class, but we're working around it. And, and it doesn't stop them from getting involved. I would just prefer that they were involved completely. And, and you said how many students, 60? We have 60. And um, we're hoping, we're gonna continue to recruit students. We've gotten some students who have now inquired because of, um, because their fa families want them involved in something. Um, so we're going to continue to enroll students and we're hoping to get our hundred by the end of September, which is when we're required to report our total population for the new fiscal year. Right. So uh, how many don't have laptops that are just using their phones? Well, the reason they're using their phones is because they don't have internet access at home. So they all have laptops. Okay, good. So they're 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 all or we issue using them. it as we a hotspot. Right. So they're they're just getting on like I would if I were on my on my phone right now with you, but I don't do that because it's not as easy for me to do. <laughs> uh, but um, the laptop part is not a problem. So they have devices. We even have iPad uh, readers. So if we needed those, we can distribute those to the students. They have devices, they just need internet access. Okay. Do you still have a special place in your heart for the Catholic schools? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm still in touch with some principals. And um, you know, you can't, you can't deny your heritage, right? I mean, tomorrow we, I'm going to attend the Mass for Sister Celeste who I credit her with getting our group of, she wasn't my homeroom teacher, but she was a teacher in the other class and she was the one who got us started on learning how to pray, say our prayers in Chamorro. So that always comes up. And good schooling, I think, um, when I think of good schooling, I still think of the Catholic schools and, and even my public school experiences, yeah. especially here on Guam. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not starting a career, I'm not building a career, so what I'm trying to do is just to have some great experiences. And I'm not gonna lie, I really enjoy being around students. Yeah. Uh, especially some of those funny ones. They, every day I have some new goofy stories to tell. I should write a book about goofy <laughs> stories. But. One, you know, right. when we talk about like the learning loss, right? So there's last year, um, and my son was a senior last year, and uh, I mean, it's hard to put into words just what the experience was like, especially because so many, especially the upper grade levels, right? They're prepping for college and it's just a lot with everything that's going on and to um, ask these students to focus and to get the good grades with everything that, that's going on because their future's at stake, right? It, it's just crazy to me. And, and here we are again this year. So like how much of a, a setback is this really? And how do you kind of explain to these kids that it's not just happening here, that it's all over the world that we're experiencing this, this, I mean, unprecedented event. Most of them are hearing it obviously from their peers, right? From their, their relatives and friends who are also not in school. But some of it, I think that we have to let them know that the expectations are that they're still gonna be learning. And, you know, for, for students who just went to college or for students who just started jobs or for students who are trying to figure out what to do after they graduate from high school, being on, 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 in an online environment actually prepares them for a little bit of independence. Because even if a teacher is not watching over you, if you've got work to do, do it. Get it done and, and do it as best you can and then seek support if you need it. So there is a certain lesson that can be learned, I think, from online learning, which is that students have to independently make sure they're getting things done and making sure they're learning as much as they can. But you know, Chris, that, that means it's incumbent on us to make those lessons even more meaningful.
and even more worthwhile because I'm not going to run a class if it's not worth it for the students. I'd rather have them just sleep in if I'm not going to have a good class. Yeah, Juan, I wanted to ask him, you know, kind of following up on Chris's question, from an educator's perspective, um, you know, the ones who run classrooms and, you know, with you yourself drawing on your experience from having run the largest or you know, the largest agency in Gov Guam as a superintendent of, at the time, DOE, and then, you know, being the private school superintendent and now running uh, the microeconomy of a school and everything like that. What um, resources have you seen or are people reaching out to you or who do you reach out to as an educator, you know, when it comes to teachers and administrators and, and faculty and everything, because they too are going through their own, you know, psychosis right. and their own fatigue of this. You know, we we have two teachers who have taught only in private schools. We have one, and, and we have two teachers who taught in DOE schools. They're now on our faculty, and they make up our component of five full-time teachers, including myself. You know what works the best for us is that we sit down almost every day. We have a room. I'm, I'm in this room right now, which is considered my office, but there's also a table where all the teachers come in and just hang out. And every day we talk about what's going on. And for me, like they sometimes tease me because they're most of them are younger than I am. And so they kind of are nice to me as the old man who needs to learn some new technology. <laughs> and, then, and then I tell them about what I know. You know, I, I, I started the year with, with training for the faculty on classroom instruction that works, which is something I've been trained on, or understanding by design, or talking about problem-based learning which I've worked on. So I share what I can with them. And then they, of course, are very polite and, and help me with dealing with technology. Um, and I think that's that's the only thing that's gonna work. Um, and I, I get, I'm on listservs. I read things every day. I send things to the teachers every single day. Um, and I think if we continue to grow, we're gonna continue to keep up with what's going on. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there that's going on that's great. There are a lot of online things that we could all benefit from. Unfortunately, when they all went online, when we first shut down in the US, they were all free. Now vendors are trying to take advantage of that and and um, trying to charge for them. I don't blame them, they invested in developing them, but we're gonna take advantage of those. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned Khan Academy before. We kind of have what I call facilitated Khan Academy where the teachers monitor what the students are doing every day. And when we were in face-to-face -face learning, the individual students could do their work, but the teachers go around and work with the individual students as well. That's a modification of what I think is a great program, uh, but it's not, it's not worth it if the students have to do it on their own. We're doing it from a facilitated perspective. Are you seeing one kind of like the same thing like for, for principals and you know, for people that, that like yourself now in your current capacity that actually run you know, school programs and everything. Is there, you know, maybe uh, group chats or, you know, like seeing as how we can't physically gather, like you said, and that's, that's obviously very, very helpful. You get that one room that everybody knows as a student, you can't go in there because that's like the teacher's lounge and everything, but, but teachers can go in there, they can network, they can share ideas, they can probably commiserate to a certain degree and everything like that. But for, it's kind of a unique challenge when you're the boss and you're in charge of a school. It's like, you know, like who do you have as peers that you can kind of like share ideas or share concerns or, or share grievances with. So is there like a little like mini network of of principals, administrators like on Guam that you guys kind of like chit chat about stuff? The two people I talk to or communicate with the most right now are Helen Nishihara at, at Island and Judy Wampak mm. um, at Guam Academy, only because of the issues, mainly because of the issues with, um, um, with charter schools in general. But one of our challenges, Chris, is e I mean, uh, Jason, is each charter school right now has a different focus. Um, and so basic teaching and learning, yeah, we can all talk about that, but actually we have a, a different area we've got to participate in. And so I'm actually very involved with ACTE, the Association for Career and Technical Education. I turned to Sam Mabini, who's the president of the Guam chapter of, of ACTE. Sure. And I go on that website almost every day or I get emails from them every day. So it's not the same as, as having a conversation, but if I keep on top of things, um, I'm going to say again that the greatest benefit I have is meeting with the teachers on a regular basis and hearing from them and then sharing what I can with them. That's been the most productive right now. Um, and it's, and it's, it is working, but, 
But I think the reason it's working is our focus is um, if we have a student who has an issue, what are we going to do to address that issue? As opposed to, you know, blaming the child or, or blaming the family or whatever. We're not doing that. Mm. We, we look around it and, and figure out how to get the student involved and engaged. That's a really critical thing. Yeah. We want to make sure every student is engaged. Well, I, I guess that is the key word that you said and probably like the key takeaway of this whole thing, one is focus, you know, both from, from a student's perspective, from a from a facilitator and, you know, for the people that actually run the entire agency, you know. So we thank you for your time and your, your perspective again and good catching up with you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Great to, to chat with you guys again. Right on. Uh, Let me know if you got any math tutors over there, Juan, that got some spare time. <laughs> Yes, I, I will suggest some tutors for uh, we could do weekly lessons before you guys go online. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. There you go. Have a great weekend. You too. You too. God bless you, Dr. Juan Flores, a career tech uh, 750.